I look to Joseph Green Bradley, Standing Committee, Christchurch, to close the case for proposition. Before I begin, I must express my gratitude to the President for affording me the privilege to speak in tonight's debate. He's put together a fantastic term card and hosted an enthralling debate so far this evening, so thank you. This time last year, as has been the case for so many years, the Oxford Union hosted its annual No Confidence debate. The speaker opening the case for the proposition commenced her speech with the following words. A spectre is haunting Theresa May. That spectre is Boris Johnson. <laughs> Cue laughter at the time and a little bit now. But <laughs> at least for me, the joke doesn't really seem so funny. The spectre now haunts Downing Street and by extension, our society as a whole. During his short tenure as Prime Minister, Boris Johnson and his government have sought to incite nationwide division and discord. They have further toxified an already febrile political discourse, <coughs> pitting Brexiteers against Remainers, North against South, and Native against Immigrant. Pretty Patel beams from the podium of the Conservative Party conference as she jubilantly promises to slash immigration numbers. Jacob Rees-Mogg lounges across the front bench of the House of Commons during a crucial debate on Brexit, embodying entitlement, disdain and disrespect. Grant Shapps complacently, patronisingly, instructs Extinction Rebellion activists to protest in another country which has a worse record on climate change prevention than ours. These lurid images have all been produced by a government which has been in power for little over three months. I'm here to convince you that three months has been far too long and to emphasise in closing the case for the proposition that it is the obligation of all in this chamber to put an end to this most excessive form of hardline Toryism at the ballot box. During this debate, you have heard Beatrice Barr eloquently outline how unstable and dangerous the government is. You have heard Barry Gardner convincingly explain how even the members opposite have no confidence in the government. In response, the opposition have reveled in thoughtless sloganeering, contemptuous oversimplification, and worst of all, a blasé disregard of the deprivations nine years of Tory austerity have wreaked over the economy and our communities. It has already been made clear, in other words, why this house should have no confidence in the government. In my speech, I will consider two of the worst consequences of Tory rule, child poverty and educational inequality, the unwillingness and ineffectiveness of the government to mitigate either, and the likelihood that they will, in fact, exacerbate these problems. By doing so, I hope to conclusively persuade you to vote with the proposition tonight. Working age benefits, cut. Disability benefits, cut. Employment support allowances, cut. Adult social care spending, cut. 600 youth clubs closed, ch closed. child care support, cut. Since 2010, the Tory party has ruthlessly dismantled the very foundations of the welfare and social security safety net. On no one has the heavy burden of austerity fallen more harshly than on its most vulnerable victims, children. Four million children live below the poverty line in modern Britain. By 2022, it is forecast that number will rise to 5 million. Let's, let's just put that in context and think about that. That's 5 million children living in families operating on, at most, £211 per week after housing costs. That would have to be split between food, bills, transport, toiletries, less frequently purchased amenities. It goes without saying that this is not an adequate way for a child to survive, never mind develop and thrive. It represents a social crisis of the highest order. Most damningly of all, this is not an accident. It is, not just according to me, but to the UN's Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, an entirely unsurprising product of governmental policies which have contributed to systematic immiseration. Those members sitting opposite who conceived of and supported the damaging austerity projects which created these conditions should feel deeply, deeply deeply ashamed. So this is what modern Britain looks like. Here unfolds the Tory ideal of society, skyrocketing rates of homelessness and food bank usage, families literally living day to day, scraping together barely enough to keep themselves alive, trapped in insecure employment or yoked to precarious zero-hours contracts. 
at only one of the three food banks in Durham city centre, just one of thousands across the country. Nearly 20,000 emergency food parcels were distributed last year alone. Clearly, the Tory party in its current manifestation <coughs> has unapologetically exploded the well-established consensus of post-World War II British politics, that the state should play a role in preserving the well-being of its least prosperous citizens. The idea that the current government, described in July as a cabinet for modern Britain, is in any sense intent on alleviating these conditions of poverty is, frankly, ridiculous. 65% of the current government attended fee-paying schools, the most privately educated cabinet since majors of 1992. At its head sits Alexander Boris de Feffel Johnson. From a family related to George II, to Eton, to the Bullingdon Club, to the Tory front bench, Johnson has personified privilege throughout his life and embodies so many of the burning injustices that plague this country. In another of the great offices of state lurks Dominic Raab, who inhumanly attributes food bank usage to those who have a cash flow problem. No experience of hardship, no empathy with poverty, no way this government is willing or able to spearhead a fight against social injustice. An even stronger argument justifying my scepticism that the government is concerned about our country's social crisis was offered to me just last Saturday by the union's esteemed secretary, the ardent supporter of conservatism and the opening speaker for the opposition. Chen Kai's words are about to bite him in the back yet again. In his words, the government is more Thatcherite than most of Thatcher's. He's not wrong. To provide just one slightly disconcerting example, Sajid Javid has slavishly admired Thatcher since he was a teenager and hangs a photo of her in his office. For him and for his cabinet <coughs> colleagues, being termed a Thatcherite may still be seen as a badge of honour. To those from the old pit villages of the North East, for whom the twin ideologies of aggressive individualism and unrestrained neoliberalism eviscerated communities and left scars upon the economic and social landscape which still show up raw in our post-industrial age, it is the sign of the devil. I've lived alongside those who really know what it's like to live in a meritocracy in which every coercive resource of the state is utilised to smash up the ideals of solidarity and communitarianism. When the working classes and the marginalised see the Tories openly displaying Thatcherite pretensions, they don't feel empowered, they don't see opportunity, they feel afraid. Everybody here should too. It's almost as if the Tory government doesn't care about the poor, the disadvantaged, the marginalised. I'm not the only person who thinks this. Johnson's chief advisor, Mr Niccolo Machiavelli, sorry, Mr Dominic Cummings. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Dominic Cummings opined that Tory MPs largely do not care about poorer people. They don't care about the NHS. I think this apathy manifests itself most brazenly through the callous manner in which they have treated our education system, something Nikki Lozen knows a lot about. Whatever your political persuasion, education should function as a means of personal stimulation and enrichment, a chance to hone one's intellect and to be guided towards the development of crucial skills for life by well-qualified teachers. Under Tory governments present and past, the vital role of education has been distorted and subordinated to the domineering ideologies of austerity. Provision of music teaching, both inside and outside the classroom, is exponentially diminishing in our state schools. The same goes for other forms of extracurricular enrichment. Drama, debating, language teaching have all suffered as state schools struggle to recruit while barely balancing the books. Education cuts are inexorably turning our state schools into nothing more than results-producing machines, unable to provide for those activities outside of the classroom, which is so vital to instilling confidence and polish into the young people most in need of it. Indeed, as a result of Michael Gove's utterly destructive reforms to GCSEs and A-levels, the quality gap between a state and private education is widening inside the classroom as well as out. A rushed and ill-conceived attempt to raise standards has instead precipitated a fall in A-level performance in the most deprived schools. Meanwhile, at the private Westminster School, teachers celebrated a record 85 pupils scoring three A-stars or more in their A-levels this summer. The promotion of policies which cater for the best off at the expense of those most in need of educational support. I'm sad to say that when it comes to the Tories, I'm really not that surprised. For all I know, the arguments I have put forward tonight have resonated with very few of you. 
you may disagree entirely with what I have concluded and believe that the Tory agenda is positive and good for Britain. Even if you do hold this view, as B has said, the tumultuous instability which afflicts the government is reason enough to assert that they will be categorically unable to deliver on any of their promises. Yet voting in favour of the proposition offers far more to you all than simply a chance to express your dis dissatisfaction with the confusion prevailing in our current politics. Tonight's historic motion provides you with the opportunity to vote for no confidence in the government and everything it encapsulates. To vote no confidence in extremism, no confidence in Islamophobia, no confidence in poverty, no confidence in cuts, no confidence in the politics of dishonesty, division and elitism. <coughs> Before long, the arguments which have been traded tonight will be played out before the country as a whole. I have every confidence the Labour government will be returned and will subsequently build a society fit for the many, not the few. I am hopeful that you all here will use your vote this evening to mark your lack of confidence in the government and in so doing, foreshadow the unleashing of a tide of opinion which will sweep the Tories out of Downing Street. Please vote for the proposition. Thank you for your time.